So today I have the honor to work to introduce Ann Sweet. She works at Carmel Play Schools. She's an autism consultant. We've worked together for many, many years. And she is a speech language pathologist in her school district. And so I'd like to introduce her so that she could present ways to support an anxious or upset child. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm Ann Sweet, as Melissa said, and um, I am a behavior analyst for Carmel Clay Schools. Um, but my first career was as a speech and language pathologist. And so a lot of um, what you will hear me talk about is that behavior really is a form of communication. And perhaps it is our child's way of, of calling out for help. Um, and so I'm also a mother of two. I've raised my kids. They're both um, teenagers and beyond. And so um, I have lived this experience in my own ways. Um, so hopefully you will pick up a few tips and tricks and some strategies from some of the things that I'm, I'm going to present today. Um, what I'm presenting today mostly is um, some of my favorite researchers, some of my favorite strategies, some of my favorite things that I do with students all the time. Um, I did with my own kids when they were growing up. Um, at times we all get anxious, at times our, we all get upset, um, happens with our kids too. So first I wanna start with the Coke bottle analogy. Um, our bodies can be like this, our kids can be like this, um, but the analogy basically is that this Coke bottle represents our children in this, in this situation. Um, and as, they, as our kids go through their typical day, different things happen that shake them up. Uh, might get them a little bit upset. Um, so maybe it is um, their clothing, um, getting on a Zoom call, a, a lesson on that's virtual, having to do their homework. Those daily events shake our kids up just a little bit at a time. And they might be able to hold it in for a certain period of time, and then something happens and they explode. Um, so one of, the, um, one of my favorite researchers and, and authors on this topic is Jed Baker, and he's written a book called No More Meltdowns. And he's got a lot of great strategies for preventing meltdowns, but also for managing them in the heat of the moment. Um, and so these, this is his list of some of those triggers that our kids have um, that might make their times of being upset a little bit more predictable for us. Um, he's got all kinds of tools to offer um, how to calm ourselves or how to calm our kids so that we don't feel helpless when they are upset. Um, and he also has a great um, bunch of, um, a great bunch of strategies for preventing repeat problems. So here's a list. Um, the first couple are gonna be really obvious to those parents who have a lot of kids um, with, with kids with a lot of sensory issues. So one, one way that we know our kids are likely to melt down is if they're hungry, if they're tired, if they're not feeling well. Um, those are definitely those internal issues. Now, some of what happens with triggers with kids are external issues. Maybe it's a sensory situation. Maybe they've got scratchy clothes on that day. Um, maybe it's just too loud. You've taken them to a loud environment and that's, that's the trigger. Um, sometimes it is that lack of structure. Um, and certainly when we're home um, during the, the, the school day, um, when we're teaching virtually or learning virtually, that can be um, a lack of structure for our kids. Challenging our new work can be a, a trigger for our kids. Having to wait long periods of time, especially if that's not one of their skills. Um, and then losing a game, threats to self-image. Those are really hard for some of our kids, making mistakes. Um, and of course, you know, wanting lots of attention. All of our kids want attention. That is, that is always the case. So that's his list of typical triggers. Knowing what our kids triggers might be can help us adjust um, a plan. So if they didn't get a lot of sleep, we might adjust their workload. We might um, ar arrange for more breaks. Um, if we're going out somewhere and we know that they might need um, an extra snack or their comfort item, uh, maybe we know that we need to prepare them ahead of time for something um, that's going to happen in that environment. Um, that really helps make things a lot smoother. Predictability is really, really important for our kids with anxiety. And we are not living through predictable times, unfortunately. 
Um, we're in the midst of this pandemic. There's lots of uncertainty. Very little is predictable right now. So what can we do to offer some predictability and structure within these um, uncertain times that we're in? So maybe it is offering your child choices within their clothing, within their food choices, within how they arrange their workspace um, or their room. Those things can be really helpful to anchor our kids in this in this type of a, um, in these types of environments. I also wanted to introduce you to Becky Bailey. Dr. Becky Bailey wrote a book called Conscious Discipline, and um, I like the model of brain states that she has presented in her book. Um, it really does explain um, why we why our kids behave the way they do. And it helps us to focus on a brain state rather than their behavior, because it gives us a really concrete way to intervene with our children when they're upset. Um, on the left, you'll see um, the brain stem is um, highlighted in red. And this is where um, our unconscious and our automatic um, nervous system resides. And so this is where our fight, flight, or freeze response comes into play. Um, when our kids are really struggling, we see them maybe run or hide. Um, maybe they will hit or kick. That's when they're in that survival state. That's when they're in, down in their brain stem. Um, and we need to kind of focus on keeping them safe in that moment. Our kids are looking, they're scanning their environment, wondering, am I safe? Um, if we can shift them out of that brain stem, if we can get them to upshift into a higher part of their brain, that's in the middle, that's the blue emotional state and that's the limbic system. And um, that is that might light up when things just aren't going our way. We're just maybe kind of having a rough day and we're feeling a little bit emotional. Um, our kids, when they're feeling emotional, they might be yelling, they might be um, cursing, they might be, um, but at least they're talking. They might, but they're, they're getting a little bit more verbal. And in that moment, they're really looking for connection. They're wondering, am I loved? Am I connected? Um, if we can answer that question for them, yes, you're loved, we're, you know, we're connected, hopefully we can shift them up to the right side of the screen, which is in green, the executive state, which is that prefrontal lobe. Um, if we can get them to shift up to that part of their brain, they might be able to do some learning and um, skill development if we can shift their brain up to that part. Um, our, our brains are wired for survival. And so we are wired to feel first and think second. Um, so as we're, as we're these feeling creatures, um, you know, our, our, our brain does develop from that, the bottom up or, or the back to the front. Um, so it's our job to help young children develop those new pathways so they can learn to plan ahead, control impulses and think rationally. And um, we're gonna go through a few examples of how to help a child upshift from their brain stem to some of that um, better thinking part of their brain. We do know that the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until about 24, 25 years old. So this takes a lifetime um, for, for um, us to really be developing those skills in our children. I really like this quote, uh, my child is not giving me a hard time, my child is having a hard time. So I want us to think of our children as struggling to handle something because it encourages us as adults to avoid bribery, punishment, those types of things. And instead, soothe our kids, get them into that upper part of their brain, the thinking upstairs part of their brain, so we can reteach the skill or teach that skill that they're struggling with. What we know about deep breathing, there's been a lot of studies on deep breathing, um, but we know that that deep breathing can really shut down that fight, flight, or freeze response and help us collect our calm and, and, and get, gain, regain our composure. So this um, breathing strategy comes from conscious discipline and they call it star breathing. So star breathing is you reach your arms out, you, take, you smile, you take a deep breath and you relax and you remind yourself, I can handle this. Conscious discipline teaches that breathing strategy for kids, but the adults need to be modeling it for the children. And so if we as adults can model that breathing, it helps us stay in our executive state and our upstairs brain, 
and helps us remember our composure so we can download our calm to our kids. Uh, one of the other roles that I have in my school district is to be a, a crisis prevention trainer. And in those trainings, we talk a lot about nonverbal communication. So that is, um, it's not the words, it's really how um, our tone and our, 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 how we hold and move our body. It's all those nonverbal ways that we communicate with our children that can escalate or de-escalate our children um, when, they're, when they're upset. So for example, sometimes we really need to give our kids space if they're, if they're really feeling upset. Um, we don't want to loom over them. Um, certainly if we were, had our arms crossed in front of us, that would send a different message to our kids. Um, and so what is usually most soothing um, in the moment of a crisis is to be off to the side just a little bit, but available. Um, we're, not, we're trying to avoid that um, eye to eye, toe to toe, that feels like a power struggle. So we want to remain um, relaxed, that relaxed, um, calm posture. Once we have those nonverbal communication pieces into place, um, there's some verbal things we can do. Um, how can we really give effective directions that increases the chance that our child will be able to follow those directions when they're anxious or upset? Um, so here's a list of ways to make our directions to our children more effective. Um, using that statement format, um, a lot of times we get into the habit of actually asking our kids questions. Hey, can you please have a seat? Um, can, you, can you please come over here? And in fact, when our kids are upset, a statement format is going to be more effective. Sit here, have a seat, feet on the floor. Those statements can be a lot more effective um, than asking a lot of questions um, when our children are upset. Distance is important. Sometimes we need to back up and give our children some space, but sometimes we need to be available and move in. Um, if we have closer proximity to our children, that increases their visual eye contact with you. Um, make sure you get their attention. Um, so making sure you use your um, proximity effectively. Um, clear and concise. We want to make sure when we're giving directions, we're really short and to the point. Um, and we're also just giving one step at a time. If you have to repeat it, maybe just repeat it one time, um, because when we repeat it over and over again, most of the time kids are, are not no longer taking in that information and they're, we're starting to, they're starting to feel overwhelmed. Um, voice volume, keep it moderate. Try to have just one adult speaking to the child at a time. Um, and as far as time is concerned, remember our kids really need time to process when we give them a direction. So waiting 20 to 30 seconds can feel like an eternity, but it's really important we give our children time to respond. We may restate it if needed, but probably just that one time. Um, using a start request, I'm gonna give you lots of examples on this in the next slide, um, but we wanna say a start request rather than a stop request. So let's start picking up versus stop arguing. Um, Try to, you know, as much as we can, we want to remain composed and controlled. Um, sometimes we talk about um, conscious discipline mentions the tone of no doubt. So having a nice calm tone, like a court reporter, um, being really specific and descriptive. So we want to avoid vague uh, terms like, I need you to sit still. That may not be very descriptive for our kids. And so we might need to say instead, feet on floor or breathe with me. That would be a little bit more specific. And don't forget, we, we need to reinforce our kids for those efforts. So acknowledging when they're making an effort and what those results are. So you're doing, you're doing it, you're cleaning up. That is so helpful. Um, I think these are good examples of, remember in the last slide, I said using a start rather than a stop. On the left-hand side, you'll see don't, don't, can't, stop. Those are things that um, can really escalate our kids. So instead we try to give them that replacement behavior. What do we want our children to do? So instead of don't hit, we might say gentle hands. Instead of calm down, we might say breathe with me. You can handle this. Um, on our team, we sometimes say no one in the history of calming down ever calms down just because you said 
calm down. It's not, it's not specific enough. And oftentimes it can um, trigger a, a bigger escalation from our kids. This next slide is um, something that takes a lot of practice, but oftentimes hearing the word no, just the actual word no, can be a huge trigger for our, our children. And it's a difficult skill to teach. Now we do want them to learn the skill of waiting. We do want them to learn the skill of handling disappointment, but sometimes hearing the word N-O can be really difficult. Um, and no can feel like forever to, to a child, especially small children. So we wanna teach our kids to collaborate with us um, and get their needs met. But in the heat of the moment, here are some ways to avert a big crisis. Um, so I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have a child that really wants to go and play with their older sibling and their older sibling is um, in their bedroom working on um, a Zoom call with their teacher and it's important that they not be interrupted. So they might be saying, I wanna go play with my sister. So we acknowledge the, the request by repeating it. You wanna go play with your sister. So just so they hear that they've been understood, that can, that can start to deescalate. Um, and then you might start by adding an I wonder statement. I wonder, I wonder which class she's working on right now. I wonder if it's math, I wonder if it's language arts. And then you can always stall for time if you need to. Um, let's go look at our photo album from that beach trip that we want on, went on this summer. Um, you may need to enter the adult perspective. Um, so you would start by saying, my concern is, hey, my concern is if we interrupt her now, it's gonna take her longer to finish her lesson and we won't be able to play with her this evening. She'll have, she'll have to make up all our homework. Um, and then offer that suitable time frame or that alternative hey, let's give her, let's, let's wait till 4 p.m. and then we'll set a timer and then we'll go knock on her door, okay? So giving that time frame, um, And then offering possible choices. So do you want to draw a picture for your sister right now or should we bake cookies so that when she's done with her lesson, we can have a snack? And then I always like to, with choices, um, off tag something on the end that Conscious Discipline um, recommends and it's, which is better for you? So if you're offering a choice between two things, asking them which one works better for you. So did you wanna draw the picture or bake the cookies? Which one works best for you? And here is um, a strategy if things escalate further with our kids. If we can't really get that um, collaboration and negotiation piece from our kiddos, this is called DN the DNA strategy and it stands for describe, name, and acknowledge. So remember, we're starting from the, the, the downstairs brain. So we're going all the way down to the brainstem. Let's say our child is really upset because they can't go uh, play on the computer. And so they're down in their brainstem and they are hitting, kicking, um, maybe hiding under a table. Um, and so we go in and we notice and we say, hey, your eyes are doing this and your mouth is doing this and your hands are doing this. And so we, we mirror what we see the child doing so that we can get their attention. And remember, we're trying to get them out of that fight, flight, or freeze. So we're trying to shift them up to the thinking part of their brain. So on the, in the middle of the screen on the left, there's a blue pause button and the star breathing. So after we describe what they're doing, we pause and we take a deep breath. We're modeling that deep breath so that our, we can download our calm to our child. Um, the next thing we wanna do is um, label what the emotion is we think that they're feeling. So we can say, you seem angry, you seem frustrated. If you aren't totally sure what they're feeling, you can even make it in the form of a question. So with that rising intonation, you can say, you seem frustrated and just let them tell you if they are or are not. They'll usually tell you. <laughs> if you got it wrong, they'll usually tell you. And if they're actually speaking to you, that usually tells you, okay, at least I've gotten them out of their brainstem. They're now in that limbic system. They're using emotion words. No, I'm not angry, I'm furious. Great, okay, so you're feeling furious. Um, you were hoping for more time on the computer. You wanted a longer turn. So we're acknowledging that's the, that's the A, that's the DNA. 
So describe, name, and acknowledge. Describe what they're looking, looking like. Um, name an emotion for them and then acknowledge what, they, what they're what they hoping or what they wanted. Um, here's another way of kind of um, phrasing the same DNA that I just talked about. Uh, during a crisis, um, if things really do start escalating in the heat of the moment, um, distracting can really be a powerful tool. I would say that's in, the, in an emergency only, that's not a great strategy for repeat problems because if we're distracting with high value novel items and their favorite activities, we might accidentally reinforce those behaviors. So we want to avoid that. But in the heat of the moment, um, if this is not a repeat problem and you're really just trying to soothe your child, distraction can be really um, a valuable tool just to soothe them so we can get them thinking um, into their thinking part of their brain. Um, after we distract, maybe we can get them, um, like we talked about, to um, start giving us emotion words. So trying to acknowledge you're feeling sad. Um, Jed Baker talks about um, acknowledge, agree, and apologize. So you acknowledge how they're feeling. You're feeling sad and you agree. That, that would be disappointing. And you might even tag on a little apology. I'm sorry you're feeling sad. You're not apologizing for anything that you did. You're just apologizing for them in being in that emotional state. Um, and then finally, if we can shift them up to that thinking part of their brain, um, we can collaborate and say, hey, what do you need? What do you, what, what, what do you think some things, some strategies would be right now? Um, maybe offering them some choices. Um, remember, not too many choices um, because they're probably really still um, struggling. So when I offer kids choices and they're really upset, I sometimes will put my hands out like this. Um, and so I'll say, hey, did you want to sit in the beanbag chair? Or did you want to sit um, in the brown chair? Which one's best for you? Bean bag, brown chair, and putting your hands out like this so that if they don't feel like talking, they can at least tap which hand, um, they, which choice they would like to make. Okay, a few other questions that I frequently get from staff and from parents. So I wanted to run through a few scenarios. What do I do when um, my student or my child is yelling and swearing and calling names? Um, probably a good idea to give that child a little bit of space. Um, they're, what they're doing there is venting. And venting can be an okay thing. If they're just venting in a safe place, um, just avoid the power struggle, give them some space and some time to do that. You wanna be nearby, um, but you wanna be safe. Um, another question I get a lot is, what do I do when my child or my student is asking just question after question after question? Um, if they're asking a lot of information seeking questions, we want to provide them with those logical answers. So what, what, am, what lesson am I, am I supposed to be doing? What page are we on? We want to make sure we answer those, those with an actual logical answer. If the questions that they're asking are more challenging in nature, we may need to redirect um, those, those questions. So they might be um, challenging you. Who do you think you are? Um, why are you bossing me around so much? Um, we want to avoid that power struggle because a lot of times our kids um, are trying to pull us into that um, back and forth conversation. And in fact, um, if we can redirect them to something else, stick to the topic is what I always say. Um, if your child is refusing, saying, no, you can't make me, um, I really think this is a, the best time to relax and practice that breathing. Um, stick to the subject. You may have to repeat your initial direction. Um, Offering choices is really powerful at this time. Um, maybe if they're doing homework, would you like to use the Chromebook or did you want to use um, mom's iPad? You know, giving them those choices. And also repeat your options or your, your directions if necessary. One other really powerful thing um, that you can create in your home is a safe spot. Um, and that's a place for your um, child to retreat when they're upset. Every child is different. Some children might, be want to, might, might want to be close to you when they're upset, and some children might to want to be in their own room or their own space far away. Um, and as long as you feel like they're being safe, that is okay. Um, remember that soda bottle analogy that we started with, and just like the soda bottle, um, if you have a soda that's been shaken up um, over time, you don't just wanna open it up all at once. You wanna open it up slowly and you wanna allow that pressure to release in a safe place. Like if you had a soda bottle and you were opening it up 
somewhere safe. It might be over the kitchen sink or something like that. And it's important for our kids to have that safe place. So maybe you practice ahead of time where they are um, practicing on a calm moment. What do you want your safe space to look like? Do you want a pillow? Do you want a bean bag? Um, do you want fidgets there? Let's practice our breathing techniques. Let's practice um, that positive self-talk, like I can do this, you know, I, I can handle these tough situations. And I just want to review in summary, we're almost finished. Um, I want to review um, the prevention plan. This is something that Judd Baker talks about in his book, No More Meltdowns. And that prevention plan is we're trying to, we're trying to move away from those reactive um, situations and trying to be as proactive as we can. Um, so if there are repeat things that are happening over and over again, we want to create a prevention plan. Um, and so there are three ways we can do this. Number one, we can change the triggers. Um, and so that might be something we talked about earlier with sensory, um, maybe adjusting the lights and that type of thing. Um, if we know it's, it's going to be a, a, a challenging task that the child is doing. Um, timing is also really important with triggers. If we are trying to teach a brand new skill and it's a really difficult skill. We want to make sure we're doing it when our child is well fed and has had a good night's sleep. Um, we want to avoid those difficult tasks when our child might be feeling sick. Um, and we also can make the task shorter when it's a brand new or a difficult task. And that makes it a little bit easier for our kiddos. Um, and also those visuals. And if you have questions about visual supports, um, IRCA has a lot of um, a, a lot of resources for you on their website um, for visual supports, how to structure your child's day um, that can make um, their um, ability to co cooperate and collaborate with you a lot a lot more likely. Um, also consider those biological and physical strategies. So remember diet and exercise and sleep. Remember to teach those um, great breathing strategies not just in the heat of the moment, but when things are going well with your kiddos. And lastly, um, we want to teach the skill um, because we don't just want to always um, avoid those triggers. We want to teach how to cope when those triggers happen. So let's talk about teaching the skill. These are some great skills to teach that Jed Baker mentions in his book. Um, there's, there's quite a few on that list. Um, so we'll just start with the first one. Um, trying when something is hard. Jed Baker has some awesome videos on his website and I will make sure that um, Melissa is going to get the resource page to you with all of those websites on it. Um, but he's got some terrific videos that offer strategies on how to try when something is hard. Um, dealing with fear. That's another skill that um, we need to teach our anxious kiddos. And if you are to go on to um, the Social Thinking website, Michelle Garcia Winner has a terrific book called Superflex. And Superflex is a superhero, and he defeats um, some of these unthinkables, like one um, that I can remember is the worry wall. And um, so if you have a child in your house that's a worrier, um, Superflex has a lot of strategies on how to deal with worries. Um, so that's a great skill to teach. Uh, tolerating mistakes and losing. Superflex also has great strategies on how to defeat. Um, uh, it's the defeater of fun, I think, is, is the unthinkable on that one. So that website is another great one. Um, teaching a child how to wait and accepting not now, but later, stopping fun. Um, Use a visual support is, is a great way to teach waiting. Teach it as a game. Hey, we're gonna play the waiting game and let's see if we can wait for one minute. And then we put the timer on and wow, you did it. You waited for one minute. And then we increase that time um, and, and we really make it um, fun and, and make it a really obvious target that we're working on. Um, positive ways to get attention. That is really hard, um, especially with a lot of people working from home and teaching their kids from home. Um, so we're trying to find those neutral times when we can practice. Probably difficult to practice in the time when we really need our children to wait and, and get our attention later. Um, and that self-advocacy for our sensory needs, we, that's a great thing to teach with visual supports as well. When you're feeling this way in your body, 
what are some things that help you feel better? What are some tools and strategies and having a couple of things out there for them to practice with? And finally, um, I am known as the hope and optimism queen. <laughs> I feel like hope and optimism is that key ingredient um, for effective behavior management in the, in the schools and in home. Um, it is a research-based concept. When we have um, optimistic adults surrounding our kiddos, we do have better outcomes. Um, when we have that confidence in our child and in ourselves, we're less anxious and we're better able to make decisions. Um, so I think this is my last slide. Um, coaching optimism, it's, it's just a great, it's a great practice to tune into our own thoughts and to coach ourselves to identify those negative thoughts and beliefs that get in our way and to challenge those negative thoughts. So you might be thinking, oh my gosh, all these situations are a major problem. But really, if we try to replace it with this one incident was a problem, but I, I will figure it out and I will get, I will get the support and the strategy that I need. Um, you might also be thinking people are judging me for my child's behavior. And it's really common when we go to the grocery store with our kiddos and they're having a rough time. But guess what? Everybody else is thinking, wow, they're doing a great job. And most parents do have times when, they, when their children struggle. Um, one other thought that pops into people's heads all the time is when my child gets upset, people might view me negatively. Um, but we have to be solid in our belief that we are, that we are a good parent and caregiver. Um, you're, watching this webinar and you're trying to really um, put all these practices and strategies into place. And um, I just want to say that I believe in you and I think you're doing an amazing job. Um, I know that it's um, hopefully you have learned a, a, at least a, one tip or two that will help um, a strategy that you can use hopefully this week. And um, I will end with a quote um, and that is that parenting is the easiest thing to have an opinion about, and it's the hardest thing to do. So there is my 